Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another exciting talk from the Oxford Guild with our Collegium Global Network and our partner societies from leading universities. Today, we're delighted to be hosting this special online event with Mark Florman, who is Chairman and CEO of merchant banking firm Time Partners, advising private equity firms globally, and he has had an extreme, esteemed career across finance and technology. Previously, he was CEO of the British a Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, the BBCA, and Mark also co-founded Eight Miles, an African private equity firm with Bob Geldof and Kofi Annan and was CEO and co-founder of Merchant Bank, Maisels, Westerberg and Co, and a long-term champion for sustainable development. Today, he'll be discussing the future of sustainable business practices and impact investing and answering your questions. Thank you very much again, Mark, for taking the time to join us and share your insights. And over to you, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Abbas. Thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening. It's a great honor to speak to you. And I thought uh, this topic was pretty relevant at the moment because our attempt here is to discuss what is a sustainable business and why impact investing is going to drive forward as a new form of business across the world, in fact. So I have a few slides and I'll, I'll show those pictures to you. I hope you can see them. If we go to slide one, uh, define impact investing on the following slide. So if we just go to the next one. So here I have put up a traditional definition, and I'm really digging into uh, what impact investing is. And we need to start here. We need to start here because this is actually the beginning of how sustainability and new business practices are going to evolve. So if you look at the definition quickly, the traditional one from 2009, from one of the principal bodies behind impact investing, is that this industry is investments made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Now, I have a few issues with this, and that's really the key reason for this uh, discussion this evening. The first is that the definition covers a very broad range of asset classes, themes, and return orientations. And it's difficult to understand for many people what we really mean. It can lead to a lot of greenwashing and a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, the definition does assume that an investor in a business or a fund has the intention to deliver a social or env environmental impact. And we should say, you know, is that good enough? Is the intention good enough? I would say absolutely not. It's not good enough because everyone can argue for an intention. So our company, Time Partners, argues that only change which is consequential to the targeted effort of the investor counts. So you must have absolute clear targets and not accept just change that is consequential to the effort. So there are two types of impact investing and purpose investing that I'm going to come to. So I'm trying to set the scene for a harder form of impact investing. This will all become relevant very quickly, I promise you. If we could go to the next slide, number two. And here I just want to touch on the history of this industry. And you might think, many of you who've heard this term might think this is surely uh, new. This is something that we've invented in the past 10 years. Well, not at all. This is the origin of business and capitalism. This is actually how business started. So I'm going to turn initially to uh, the spectrum of capital. Uh, and I'm just picking here from the earlier 20th century. So uh, capitalism or uh, capital and the allocation of capital. Firstly, you have a duty, a fiduciary duty to the owners and your investors. And coming alongside that was the development of a broader responsibility, a philanthropic sense, especially by the Victorians. In the 18th century until today, we developed a lot of thinking around socially responsible investing. In other words, to think about the people that you affect or impact as you build a business. In 2006, the UN released the Responsible Investment Principles, UNPRI, that many companies now sign up to. I would argue these are not nearly strong enough, but they were a good start. It was actually the, it was my old friend uh, Kofi Annan who led this. From the beginning of the 1990s, we had at the same time this movement uh, embracing sustainable investing. And the principles here were that you need to build a business that uh, will survive different shocks and events. And you have to think carefully about how you treat people, both within your company, also your customers, 
your suppliers and people who work within your supply chains, and also perhaps how you treat everything that you use, the climate, land, um, raw materials. Uh, I'll give you just one example. When I was at Doughty Hansen a few years ago, we bought a, a business in, uh, in the States uh, called Tumi, a very good luggage company. And the, the business uh, cost about $250 million enterprise value. And we decided to build this into a long-term sustainable strategy. And by that, what I mean is that we didn't want to make as much money as possible, improve a few of the products, increase market share and sell the business. Instead, we wanted to create a different type of company. So we went to China, where many of the supplies came from, looked at the factories that were supplying the ballistic materials within the luggage and found very young people, children working, supplying the company. And we started to affect change, everything from how the materials were made to how they're shipped, how the product is created and built and how we market and present it. So for example, all the lights were turned off in the shops at night all over the world. So we built what we believe was a strong and sustainable enterprise. And this was a hell of an investment, but we made uh, a good return on it, uh, despite spending so much money, because we put the price up of the product and we then launched it as a fully sustainable product that people could be proud of owning. And the return was very good. So there was this correlation beginning between ethics, decency, well-run companies, and profitability. And that started in the sort of sustainable investing trends in the 1990s. In the early 2000s, people started to think, let's take this a step further. Why don't we try and measure some of the impacts we're having, both positive and negative? And why don't we try and measure them continuously over time? So if we're misusing people, or if we're generating good jobs, let's try and rate those, rank them, and perhaps try and find some sort of metric to record how we're doing. So impact investing started, and I'll come back to these finer definitions in a second. Towards the end of this period, meaning about four years ago, we started to create the external rate of return. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with an IRR, but when I made a speech to um, African leaders in Mauritius about six years ago, I was explaining the internal rate of return, the return to the pensioners who give you their savings to invest in companies. And uh, they weren't so familiar with that. So I decided to go further and explain the impact that growing a business would have on communities, on society, on the environment. They could be positive and they could be negative. And we came up with the term, the external rate of return, which is my method of measuring and checking how a, a business has an impact on society and on the environment. And I'll come back to that more in a minute. So if we go to slide three. So evolution of impact. So this is really, really important. And I'll have so many people who will disagree with me here, which I, um, and I'd love to get questions on this. So number one, old fashioned focus on return to shareholders. That's all that matters. The theory behind that is that that will attract more capital and with more capital, you'll be able to do better things, build more companies and create more jobs. So there's nothing traditionally wrong with that. But that evolved into, as I say, sustainable businesses. And here's my definition of a sustainable business. So that is, is my definition. There'll be many variants on it, but you'll notice right in the middle, I have words like fair play, standards of governance, practices across the organization and practices down the supply chain, which means if you're making t-shirts, for $3 or $4 on the high street, how's that possible? So to be a truly sustainable business, you have to think of how you're dealing with people and treating everything from every raw material to every person involved in the production of something. And there on the right is therefore the modern evolution of impactful businesses. And here I have two definitions. This is really important because it drives how capital is allocated. The first on the left is profit with soft purpose, which is our definition of time. A soft purpose, this relates to what I said at the beginning, businesses seeking impact with significant outcome objectives, but no mission lock. And I'll try and explain that by looking at the one on the right, 
profit with hard purpose, businesses with intent, duties and reporting on impact performance and locking in social or environmental missions. And sometimes that lock can be set within the articles or simply by the board of directors. The key test here is that if you sell the company to a new owner, can the purpose be changed? If it can be changed, it's a business with soft purpose. If it can't be changed, it's a business with hard purpose. And a lot of uh, uh, regulations across the world and how governments approach these businesses are based on these very slight differences in definition. So if we look at uh, page, page four, so I'm going to come on to the crisis that um, you and we are all living through and how I think some of this uh, business theory will impact the sort of businesses that I hope you will build and perhaps work for in the many years ahead. We have at the moment, I think, the beginning of a new era of mutual responsibility. I think we must have that. It has been growing for a long time since the financial crisis 10 years ago. But today, I'm looking to try and build an argument that there must be much greater cooperation between business, workers, community and the earth. And I've put forward many papers. You'll find many of these on the Time Partners website or on my personal website. I've been writing for, for 20 years and most of my writing goes to governments. Uh, we, um, we've also, between myself and a few friends, started some think tanks like the Center for Social Justice, the Early Intervention Foundation, and most recently, a new one, the Center for Economic Recovery. And I started the Center for Economic Recovery, I think it's .org.uk, uh, so brand new, difficult to find probably. But on that website, you'll see many of the papers that we've released to this government in the UK in the past eight weeks. So we've been writing uh, actively to try and uh, promote some of the new ideas on how we can come out of this crisis with a new form of business. So please take a look there. Let me have your comments. Those papers have gone directly to the Prime Minister and others in government, arguing for, in principle, a cooperation between the state and the private sector. You may have noticed that much of what is going on at the moment is dominated by the state. The Treasury, the Bank of England, the Business Department and others seem to be making all the running. And my argument has been, please involve the private sector. If we do involve the private sector, we're going to be building sustainable businesses which will generate more resilient portfolios for the investors, for pensioners and others. And we need this resilience and this is how you build stronger companies, companies that will sustain against the sort of shocks that have been uh, going through the system. You may have seen, you probably haven't, but you may have seen a letter that I wrote to the Financial Times uh, published on Tuesday. And there it said that the public markets, um, public equities are a bit like a circus, high volatility, impossible to follow, chaotic involvement from traders globally, easier to follow the private markets where I specialize, private capital, private equity. And here also is the place where we build new techniques and new methods in building more sustainable businesses and businesses with impact. So I've said here also businesses with strong social contracts. And that means a social contract is my definition of a strong relationship between the activity of the business and everyone that is affected by that business. And then you can measure impact. That is, if the business exists, what impact is it having? Intended and unintended. That's the soft and hard purpose that I mentioned earlier. And then you can begin to weight the impact by the importance of the value. And you introduce multipliers. And I'll just to find this uh, in the next slide in a moment. So let's, um, let's go on to slide number five. So here we have um, Impact 2020 looking forward. So I think the first thing that we need is a clear definition around purpose companies. And for me, a purpose company is a business that thinks of a triple bottom line. It's a very popular throwaway phrase. And what it really means is that you're thinking of your impact upon people, people who work for you, but also 
consumers and those in the supply chain. Think, uh, think uh, T-shirts made in Bangladesh, the planet and profit. And you must have profit. Don't go too far because without a good profit returning to the investors, there will be no more capital. So you need to fight for your capital allocation. And this type of business uh, produces a sustainable and a circular economy. So at the heart of a truly purposeful company is the circular economy. And uh, if you're looking for definitions of that, I'd look, for example, at a great fund in Edinburgh called Circularity Capital. And they believe in investing in businesses that maximize the recycling of raw materials for a second or a third go. For example, they own a carpet business, tiling business, where 99% of an office uh, carpet can be recycled into a new office carpet, the circular economy. The second thing that we'll be looking for is to rebuild economies with cooperation from us in the private sector. You'll see in the papers that I produced recently, 85% of people in this country, in the UK, um, work for the private sector. And how many members of the private sector are currently involved in the crisis? I'd say probably about 0.01 of 1%. We also generate 100% of the tax, which some people tend to forget. So I've argued all the time for a partnership between business, society and state. And a recent paper that I wrote, or I put out on Twitter, I think, uh, is to form BEGE. Now, I hope all of you have heard of um, the, the SAGE group, uh, the, the, the scientific advisory group for emergencies, 50 members advising our government. But what I can't understand is why we don't have a BEGE a business ad advisory group for emergencies. Why aren't there a hundred people? And then we might get a greater balance. Many other countries have that. And the third principle that I want to introduce is long-term thinking. We have an aging population, a contracting human pyramid, meaning far fewer children than before and many, many more elderly people. The total population, I think, of the world will cap at about 11 billion, a little bit less than the UN forecast. We're currently at about 7.8. Climate crisis, the rise of nationalism, probably accentuated by this current health crisis. And we need new skills for new types of jobs and terrible demand on resources. So these are just some of the things I speak about in my longer term view. And I make a speech about where we're going to be in 2050. And my argument here is unless you think about the next 30 years, you can never make the, make the right decisions in the next year or two. So purposeful companies, rebuilding economies in cooperation with the private sector and long-term thinking. This is what I often do when I'm not doing anything else, which is to argue with governments, especially the British one and other Europeans and African ones about this type of thinking. So if we have a, let's go on back to forward, forward to page six and um, a little bit more on impact investing and the, 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 the role that this plays. So I think the new world that will emerge by 2025 is going to be a new normal. It won't be an academic philosophy. So broader purposes will be built into the articles of associations of companies. So as you start your companies, you can think a little bit about what type of company do I want to have what is my purpose? What is my point? Is there a purpose greater than maximizing the profit or the return on capital? And some years ago, we worked on um, purpose-driven companies and proposed to the government that new articles should be created so you can form either a company for stakeholders or a company for shareholders. And today that is now common practice across the US and it's arriving in the UK. If you have duties to all stakeholders, then uh, you that means not just um, the people that you're investing the money of, but everyone who works for you and is impacted by you. And if you look at the graph below, this is these are your stakeholders. And this, coincidentally, is the same thing as the external rate of return metric. So these are the things that are affected by your business. So in the center, you have the first vector 
Now imagine you, you've either bought a company or you're building a company or you're investing in a company. This is true purpose reporting or true impact reporting. In the center, the company is impacted. How many people are you employing? Are you growing jobs? Are you introducing skills? Are they quality jobs? And um, how are you leaving the company after a few years? For example, intellectual property, has it been built? The second vector is your suppliers. And I put them right next to the company because treating your suppliers well will build a stronger company. Again, T-shirts, Bangladesh comes to mind. The third is customers. This is only to do with new products and new services. If you create a new form of life insurance or a new type of entertainment or a new healthcare treatment, um, this is new to economies that are very weak or areas that are very poor. And that new invention or new introduction should be valued positively. The third is your contribution to your country, taxes generated. And the fourth is your contribution to the environment. Now notice that all of these could be negatives and all could be positives. And our thesis is that all should be measured over time continuously in these five vectors. Now within those five, there are about 30 further measurements. If you measure those successfully, you can judge the success and contribution of your company to uh, the world at large. So this is true purpose reporting. If we look at page seven, on the next page, thanks, Harry. So here we have a positive correlation. So what I'm arguing is something relatively simple, that there will be no need in the future, and I'm hoping it starts now, to concede a financial return if the behavioral change by the consumer and the worker is as we predict here. And this change is as follows, that if the company on the left behaves well, so that's my definition of sustainable business, good behavior, it's as simple as that. So everything I've said before comes down to one thing, the total behavior of the company. If you behave well, you're an ethical and decent company measuring your total impact on all metrics. More people will come to work for you, maybe better people, meaning the most qualified, and your customers will be happier. More people will come and shop with you. Imagine a coffee shop where they treat their neighbors well, they treat their people well, they purchase well, and they dispose well, and they use perhaps you know, renewable power, something like that, probably you'll get more customers. And that means your business will develop well and you will attract more capital because if the company develops well, you attract more capital. So there becomes a positive correlation between behavior, skills, consumers, expenditure, sales, and further capital. And therefore there is a positive movement. This hasn't happened for about a hundred years, not since the end of the Victorians. And this is what is about to return. If we look at the next page, I'll just give you the final picture and then I'm going to finish uh, because I've been traveling quite quickly so we can maybe go to some questions. So here's my final picture to try and explain all of this and wrap it all up. So on the left, you have the internal rate of return. So let's say the pensioners give you their capital, the pension funds invest in your business or in your private equity fund, and you build value for them. And over five years, you then return it by selling the company and you create uh, a return. That is your dollar unit profit. That's your internal rate of return. Uh, that's the investment. All of the other metrics are your impact on the world on jobs created, skills, taxes generated for the communities, for your country, and on uh, the environment. All of these could be positive or negative. And there's some really difficult things to think about in here. For example, if you build a forestry business that employs hundreds or thousands of people who've never had jobs before, and you deliver for them jobs and income and opportunity, and an education effectively for their children. What are they doing with these jobs and what are they doing with this forest? They might be cutting it down. So you cannot win 
everywhere. But if you measure everything, the impact on skills, jobs, communities, taxes, environment, it's this methodology that gives you the total return. So there on the right, you have the external rate of return, and you can rank these in different units and metrics. And on the left, you might get 20% per annum, and on the right, you might get a unit value of say seven to 15. And there are certain methodologies that we've developed to report on that. And that I think is actually the future of business. And this is impact investing uh, in, in a complete way. So if we just go to the final page, um, this is just me. So I'm in, in London, in Parliament Square, as close as possible to the government, so I can try and keep an eye on them. And uh, I publish a lot on, on Twitter and papers on, on my personal website. And there's that new website for the new think tank. So I'll stop there and then uh, hope uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, brilliant, brilliant overview of things there. Yeah, as you can imagine, we've had a bunch of bunch of questions coming in, so might as well uh, get started on those. Yeah. Uh, so first one here is coming from Sam, uh, who's doing history and politics at Oxford. And Sam asks, which regions of Africa do you think stand to be the worst affected by the current pandemic? As those who... Uh, very sadly, those with the highest population densities. So some regions of Africa have an incredibly low population density. As you know, it's the most underpopulated continent in, in the world. And therefore, a large number of countries will, will manage to, to escape, probably Botswana, for example. But uh, sadly, the current rate of growth is in South Africa. That's, that's the worst. Tanzania, where they didn't uh, recognize and respond quickly and they refuse to accept that it is a, a, a terrible disease. Um, many populations are extremely rural, so it's the great cities. That's Lagos, Johannesburg and Nairobi. Okay, very, very interesting. A question here from uh, Rahul doing economics at Warwick. And uh, Rahul asks, uh, what do you think is behind the success of private equity in recent years? Yeah, well, it's a great question for me. Thank you so much for that question. Um, well, if you see my letter to the Financial Times on Tuesday, um, where is it? It might be on my website by now. Um, definitely, I'll, I'll send it to you. So I argued there that private equity uh, is a disciplined and structured methodology to own a company. It introduces uh, governance and alignment of interest between the owner and the manager. And together, they try and agree on a, say, three to seven year plan for a business. And it's normally based on building a better business because you can only sell a better business well. And that means addressing all of the risks, including uh, risks to reputation, to poor business practices, to unsustainable business practices, like my Toomey example, it's the introduction of high operational and industrial skills to complement those of the management. So the intensity of the work and the partnership drives change. However, if you go back about 15 years and before that, some of the success was based on leverage, that is putting quite a, quite a lot of debt alongside the equity. Today, the amount of debt in private equity companies is the same as in public equity companies. So it's a non-issue. The difference in value is about 7% per annum over public equity, and that's due to the intensity of the work. And in, in, in other words, not, not, not remaining lazy, but remaining active and, and focused with a deadline for change, such as we have a five-year plan. That means we're going to be selling the company again in five years. That really makes a difference to the way people behave. Great, thank you for that. I have a question here from Kabir doing computer science at Cambridge. Kabir asks, is the rise of China as a major player in the international economy as much of a threat as people often make it out to be? Oh, I don't think so at all. I think thanks to China's growth, uh, we have the most fantastic um, change in the wealth of the world. 
And uh, I would say to the wealth and um, opportunities for 1.3 billion Chinese people, uh, I think what you, you must be thinking of, Kabir, is the um, implied threat to international business and to international democracy, because some of the business practices are a little bit different and maybe shocking to some who've grown up in, in the West. So examples of that would be um, in you know the initiatives that the government takes to coalesce its strategy in business development, international relations, foreign relations, defense, military spending, and infrastructure. These coalesce very well when you come to developing economies, let's say in uh, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Africa. So a proposal from a Chinese company in Africa might carry with it slightly different uh, ideas to a proposal from a Western uh, company. That's one reason why the Prime Minister a few days ago here has decided to merge the Department for International Development with the Foreign Office, and I think will then go on to bring in the Trade Ministry. We actually need to wake up a little bit and try and be slightly more coordinated in our relationship to other economies. Um, China has done quite well from that point of view. Very interesting. Here's a, a question from Ling doing PPE at KCL, obviously picking up on your extensive work with, with the government. Um, Ling asks, uh, the behaviour of our present government in this crisis seems to have threatened the contract of trust between the government and the people. What can the government do to rebuild this? That is an incredibly difficult question. I, I think there is uh, implied a contract of trust between government and people because the people entrust a government to govern soundly and to provide them with the opportunity to develop and grow, to build businesses and to have security and to look after families. The, the pure duty of a government is to provide an infrastructure or a framework from which uh, businesses, families can grow safely and securely. Uh, there's some incredibly interesting examples of a duty of a government, let's say in, in Eastern Europe. If you look at some of the newer and younger economies in the Baltics, they believe that their duty is to provide the framework for business to, 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 to flourish and not to get, not in to, get, to get in the way and not to interfere. In the more complex old Western economies like Britain, um, we have very opinionated governments at the moment, and just at the moment, a government that is telling us what to do uh, minute by minute, or indicating that this is their guidance. And this is extremely difficult for some people to accept. It is necessary because of the terrible health crisis um, to be quite strict, but it has extreme dangers built into it. Uh, one danger is that we're effectively nationalizing jobs and we're nationalizing companies and we're unbalancing the natural, natural flow of money and capital. And this imbalance will take years to correct. So I think the trust is going to diminish further before it's going to get any better. How to rebuild it? Include the private sector in your decision making. Form BAGE, B-A-G-E. And next time there's a crisis in health, have a sage and a beige like other countries do. And then you wouldn't be held responsible for all of the decisions alone. You'd be working in partnership. Okay, interesting. Um, a, a question here from Matthew doing history at Warwick. Matthew says, you mentioned that the positive correlation of companies' behaviour hasn't been seen since the Victorian era, but is set to return now. What do you think is driving this? Um, I th yeah, it's such a good question. So why would it return now? I think it's a, a renewed consciousness that the division in wealth the gin, I call it the, the Gini, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Gini coefficient, which is the relative um, distribution of wealth within a country, uh, has not closed. We still have exceptional poverty, and we still have um, great inequality. 
And despite uh, recently 30 years of economic growth, for example, in 1992, the world um, percentage of poverty, the definition of poverty, that is people who live back then on below $1.25 a day, was 46% of the globe. 46% of people in the early 1990s lived in absolute poverty. Many years later, that number is now way down to about 9%. It's a slightly different definition, but the number of people have increased enormously. You know, we've grown the world's population from 2.8 billion in 1950, and we're ending up at 11.5 billion in 2050. So we've almost quadrupled the size of the planet in 100 years. So the inequalities are not closing, they're increasing. And what's happened is that now we can see them. So if you're a child in Uganda, and you, you now have possibly sight of a smartphone, at least somebody within 20 families has one. And you can see pictures of Paris and London and New York. And your thought is, let's go, let's move, let's try and see what that world is like. So what we've created is a world of extreme growth in capital and, and wealth for some, uh, the perpetuation of extreme poverty for others. And now we have uh, sh shown it through the internet and through mobile telephony. We can see pictures of this disparity everywhere. And I think those with capital and those in positions of responsibility have realized that if they don't address this disparity, their world is going to come and bite them. And this is the fundamental reason for the social unrest and the um, real difficulties faced in the UK and the US recently. And that's why if you then admit that things are not perfect, but you could perhaps close those gaps, how would you do that? Well, then you'd begin to measure your total contribution to society. And that's why impact investing and sustainable business practices are coming back very quickly. In banking and wealth management across the West, the most common issue is how to build sustainable businesses and to drive businesses with purpose to help cure the inequalities. Brilliant, very interesting. Uh, nice question here from, from Diana doing law at LSE. Diana says, you've been involved in an impressive range of initiatives throughout your career. What are you most proud of out of everything you've been, you've achieved slash been involved with? Well, that's such a kind question, Diana. Thank you very much. I went to the LSE. Um, I was well, very generous of you. I think the, the proudest thing uh, was when I went to northern Uganda about 15 years ago. I was asked by a chief executive of a charity to help him because he was just a charity and he wanted a business person to help him think. And they were building schools. They had sponsored children. So they have a, about 50,000 sponsors in the UK sponsoring 100,000 children in northern Uganda. And the money was going to the families. I interviewed some of the children and families. And I said, what's the most important thing in your life? And the children said, my sponsor. Uh, there were, let's say, four to six children per family. And half of them didn't have sponsors. And I felt this was, this was sort of deeply emotionally corrupt. Because if they didn't think that their brothers and sisters and parents were the most important thing, there was something deeply wrong with this uh, development model. So I said to the charity, why don't we build more schools? Why don't you just finance the school directly and then include the whole community in the development of the school? Then all the children can go to school. They can have school uniforms, meals, books, equipment, and let's help the parents start businesses. So we developed this VSLA, Village Saving and Loan Association program. So when we started, there were three or four schools. Um, most of the children had some sort of benefit, like a mattress or a bit of a uniform or a broken bicycle, but they weren't attending proper schools. We've now built 162 primary schools for, for about 100,000 children a year and 3,500 um, village saving and loan associations. And the charity, it was called Build Africa, and now it's part of Street Child. And I think what, what that taught me was that just 
like a, no, a nobody like, like me, but with a, a, a strong drive, could get on a plane to Kampala and make a difference. Wow, that's very nice. Um, question here from Jack doing medicine at UCL. Jack asks, in your blog, you wrote about uh, the potential of the pandemic to push us further apart, deepening tribal bias and nationalist rhetoric. How do we combat this? Well, we have terrible nationalist rhetoric. We've had it since the beginning of the referendum. I think it's going to continue because people will be more frightened about importing and developing international supply chains. Economies will be a lot weaker. Therefore, it'll be tempting to try and secure your supply locally. A lot of companies failed in the first few weeks of the pandemic because they couldn't get their components. So just in time, global supply chains will um, will will be really difficult for, 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 for smaller businesses to live with. So we, um, uh, so I think, how do you cope, therefore, with the suggested rise in um, building, well, nationalism or building more domestic economies? It's really difficult because the bottom line is that if we all become more nationalistic, we're all going to become a lot poorer. So wealth is created through specialization. And let's say France just, you know, made cheese and we just made beef, you know, we'd, we'd be quite quite wealthy because we then uh, trade and the whole world is, is built on hundreds of thousands and millions of um, tr trading systems and uh, through um, you know through through being more successful and more specialized and creating true added value that's how true wealth is created so any anything that damages the free flow of trade is a step back and that's why I was, I was proud actually to be the um, Conservative Party's treasurer for Remain. I was a, a Remainer and I argued, and we lost, but I argued really hard to say uh, you must continue with global and international cooperation. And we, we sit at the centre. I used to think that Britain was at the centre of Europe. It's just that geographically we're not, but emotionally we should be at the centre of Europe in the richest single marketplace in the world with 625 million consumers, we have it made. So the possibility to trade, learn, exchange uh, was extraordinary. So I was personally very, very disappointed um, with Brexit. If you've got Brexit and threats to the economies and incredible debt and the, the cutting off of supply chains, um, we are in some difficulty. So what we need to do is we, we need to reset the argument on where growth and wealth comes from and why cooperation is actually a fundamentally good thing for our futures and our security. So we need you. So the bottom line is we need you in the future to help with this argument if you believe in it. And you must obviously counter that argument. Many of you listening will say this is rubbish. Let's build wealth domestically. Let's employ the weakest and those with the poorest qualifications in our own country and give them jobs. And I could spend three or four minutes to giving you that argument as well. And there's plenty to say for it. And there are a lot of people who've been left behind in this country as well. And I have total respect for that. Okay, brilliant. A question here from Katie doing, or who did PPE at Oxford. Uh, Katie asks, can you give us some more examples of companies which have hard or soft purposes? And have you seen companies with a soft, pur soft positive purpose slip backwards? Well, firstly, uh, a lot of companies, millions, have soft positive purposes because they will come out and say that their purpose, their, their, their duty, their purpose, uh, or their mission, or something like that, is to achieve the following. Let's say to make a better cappuccino or to deliver a more sustainable product. Um, they might uh, a more ethical um, clothing range. So a soft purpose is actually a statement of intent. And this is where you enter greenwashing. And there's a lot of greenwashing. So all you've got to do is um, look at any business and say, here's my, you know, here's my look and feel. I'll give you an example. Uh, there are companies all over the world using the word Maasai after the tribes of East Africa without their permission. And they might 
say that they have a soft purpose and it's to do with strength, um, discipline, uh, mission, and then they might have an image of Maasai people. They're trying to associate a product, whatever they're making, maybe shoes, with a type of character and this is this is branding so that's, there's a lot of soft purpose and hard purpose is where you actually set out to achieve something when you start the hard purpose is that i am going to achieve the following and then you're prepared to be measured by it and if you're not prepared to be measured with these impact metrics there are many including the external rate of return then it's it's a softer purpose hard purpose impact investing will actually be correlated to compensation from the investor. So the investor will reward you for the hard purpose outcome. If you don't have an explicit financial reward for meeting the purpose, then it's soft. This is a bit complex stuff, but I hope I've made that, that clear. I covered some of it in those slides. I actually got a quite a good follow up to what you were saying there about measurement of, of impact uh, from Thomas doing mechanical engineering at Imperial. Thomas asks, is there a common set of standards for measuring impact or are there many different measures? There are about 150 measures at the moment, Thomas. So um, everyone wants to find a different way of measuring. And there's no problem with that because the heart of any measurement should come into the sort of the soul of the company itself. So let's say I have a mission to build um, uh, a fisheries business. And in my fisheries business, I associate myself with one SDG, let's say blue oceans. I want to build more sustainable fisheries uh, in every sense. And possibly one of my missions is to reduce um, plastic in the sea, which often comes with fishery businesses. And therefore, how would I measure my success? One of them would be on certain sustainability measures related to um, ensure fish populations remain constant. And another would be plastic emissions and plastics removed. You would have to design these two. And then you'd say, this is what I want to be measured on. Then somebody might turn up and say, well, hang on. There's this much more complex impact metric measurement system and uh, you're not adhering to all these other values and measures. And you could argue, no, I'm just focused on these and I'll be judged by these. But don't let them get away without reporting on everything else. This is my tree example. What if you say my mission is to generate jobs for the people of Ecuador in the forests and I've generated a thousand jobs. And how did you do that? Because a thousand people chopped down all the balsa wood trees that are unique to, to Ecuador. So we've lost an incredible tree population. If you chop down balsa wood trees, you can't make wind blades properly because wind blades in windmills are made of balsa wood on the inside. So the unintended consequence of a clear and impactful business purpose, you've got to measure the total effect, not just what you're after. So it's a very complex area, but I wouldn't try and adhere to a single metric that is that is too disciplinarian. I would allow the creative individual and in his company to say, this is what I believe in and I'm prepared to be measured by it. Okay, brilliant question here from Anne in history at Harvard. Um, and Anne asks, uh, what kind of career path would you recommend for university students who want to maximize the positive impact that they can have on the world? Hmm. I have heard the question. It's like, that's just so difficult. Oh, it's got, well, it, there's no answer to that. It's got to be based um, on your um, on your inner skill, what you feel, really feel that you could be good at and make a difference with. Um, the easy answers would be technology. Uh, I would look at uh, my friend Frode Odegaard in... Um, in San Francisco, he runs a post lean Institute. And in, in many of my speeches, I think you, you might be able to find on my website, um, my pictures of where the world will be in 2050. And there I predict enormous change in, in jobs and where jobs will be created. There'll be very few, there'll be fewer jobs 
low skill jobs will disappear and middle and high skill jobs will be in high demand. So if you just look at some of the trends in technology and how businesses are growing. So I'd say technology skills, engineering skills, mathematical skills, communication skills. But otherwise, I would be uh, too, too bold to say much more. Thank you very much for that. A question here from Jan doing uh, law at LSE. Uh, Jan says, you've written about the importance of diversity. We've recently seen many companies, e.g. venture capital uh, companies uh, and brands, talk about how they want to help improve this. How do we ensure they walk the walk? So diversity is a big topic, and you should look at the work of my friend June Sarpong, who's now Director of Diversity at the BBC and her book, Diversify. And diversity is a little bit of everything. It's people who are just not necessarily the sort of people that you'd expect to be right in front of you all of the time. So there's gender diversity, there's diversity in, in race and ethnic origin, there's diversity in age. And do you know how many people just sort of tend to say, look, he's not experienced enough or she's not experienced enough, let's get an older person. I was advising Nigeria on the development of their sovereign wealth fund. And I suggested that uh, I think it was one third of the trustees are under the age of 35. Because I thought diversity in age was important because younger people will have a longer term view. So the question that you're really posing is, should you legislate for diversity or should you encourage it to grow naturally? I very much think it should be the latter but you should argue for it by seeking the positive um, values in a diverse debate. So if June was here, she would say, and she's one of our advisors at Time Partners as well, she would say, take 10 or 12 people and put them around a table and give them a couple of hours to design a product. And they're all you know, probably quite, quite well educated, but not necessarily maybe uh, one or two are not so well educated and there should be some who are quite young and some old and some of different races and religions and of, of different genders and then see what sort of product comes out and then in the next room have uh, the same number of people but all of them have to be 58 and they're all white and they're all male and they all went to oxford and see what type of product comes out of that room and I can guarantee you the first product is going to sell more successfully. That's true diversity. So the only way to argue that is to argue that you will be better informed as to how society will react to your invention if you include more people in the making of that invention. It's a great point. Um, question from Molly doing biology at Imperial. Molly asks, how might you make business supply chains more sustainable without increasing product prices? For example, for business models around low cost products for lower income customers. Um, well, let me look, just look at this question again. It's on my screen, so I'm just looking at it. Is it on your screen as, as well? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so how might you make business supply chains more sustainable without increasing product prices? Yeah, well, I don't think you necessarily can. Um, the trick here is information. So let's take a famous um, uh, retailer in Europe of clothes. And I wonder if Many of you have seen that film. I was just, just forgetting the name of it. It's five years old on uh, fast fashion. And um, what you have to build into your supply chain is the cost and price of everything as you work up the supply chain to the final product. Now, you want to produce a product for a lower income customer. So let's say you want to produce this famous T-shirt for $3 instead of $4. And that is an important difference. Well, how do you do that? If you uh, rely on driving down the labor cost in Bangladesh, 
then you've achieved that. And you might think, I, I've done well there. The alternative is to pay the right labor cost in Bangladesh at the fair price, which is what all these campaigns are about at the moment, and then work back upwards and try and create more efficiency in your production elsewhere, in your transport costs, in your head office costs, or you pro provide some sort of discount um, to the lower income consumer. But that is an extremely difficult question. And out of all the questions I, I've had, I'd say I'm almost flummoxed on that one, which is why it, it took me 20 seconds to understand it. It's incredibly difficult and it's almost impossible to um, to get that right. It's a conundrum of life, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, here's a, a question from Isabel doing English at Nottingham. Uh, Isabel says, some companies seem to be taking on ESG values to satisfy society's demands for better corporate values. Do you see this as dangerous for the future? Yes, uh, in a way. What you're saying is, are they taking on these values because it looks good? Damn right it looks good, and exactly that's what they're doing. And half of them don't understand what they're doing, and they're greenwashing. So, for example, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment was the first great signal that you should adhere to these standards. So a few years later, after it was introduced, about, what was it, about 2006, um, you could buy membership of UNPRI. So it's about, it was about $4,000 a year or something like that originally. So it's separated from the UN. It was still called the UNPRI. It was a body and you were able to purchase membership of it. So uh, a typical venture capital or private equity firm could sign up to the principles. So what you do is you adhere to the principles and then you receive the logo but nobody checks on whether you actually adhere to those principles. This is now traveled because ESG, which is, you know, the uh, more old fashioned or technical name for total sustainability has become uh, essential as a minimum standard for good business practices. That means, you know, good business practices in your relationship with the environment, Secondly, with society, society often meaning the people you impact, jobs, supply chains, labor conditions, quality of jobs, things like that, and, and governance and how you behave and how you trade and how you deal with people. All of that is now sustainable business practice. The, where this will work is my thesis, which I presented earlier, which is those companies which demonstrate a lower level of sustainability and duty will be found out and they will be found out because you guys will find them out for us through social media through online pressure through much greater transparency and if all of them embraced purposeful and impactful reporting they'd be found out automatically very interesting uh question here from james uh doing geography at ucl uh, James says, you mentioned the merger of DFID and the Foreign Office. Do you think this will be a net positive or a net negative from the perspective of international development? Hmm. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, so I think that this is very interesting. I think overall it'll be net positive for UK PLC. And that's because we'll be able to coordinate our relationship with other countries in a more efficient way. So as we travel to Tanzania or Kenya or wherever, um, the budgeting and the tactics, the strategy and the cooperation between our foreign office, our international development work, including CDC, um, our military uh, spending, and our trade, most importantly, will be slightly better coordinated. At the moment, there's very poor coordination. I was privileged enough to be on both David Cameron's uh, only trip around Africa and on Theresa May's only trip around Africa, as I, as I work extensively. And when I got onto the plane a few years later, I thought I was, I'm the only one who was still here. Both of those trips, we visited a number of countries um, but, I mean, DFID, CDC, Foreign Office, Defence, 
trade, um, everyone was uncoordinated. So I think for, for UK PLC, it is better that we coordinate. I don't see it necessarily as a loss. The worry here is that our international aid tactics and expenditure will become politicized. And that let's say if we're trying to respond to an aid need in um, Tanzania, we will relate the provision of that need and our capital to some other deal. And I honestly don't think that will happen. And I don't think it'll happen. And this sounds strange, but I think we know better than that. But in a soft way, there probably will be a degree of correlation and cooperation between the departments. I think actually it's going to go further, and I would predict that the Foreign Office will assume the Trade Department as well quite soon, and that'll allow for complete coordination. This is partly a consequence of Brexit, because as we're free from the EU, uh, we can make our own decisions globally on everything. And it's much easier to make a decision if everything is coordinated at the centre. And remember that Boris Johnson was our Foreign Minister for two years, travelled to about 20 countries in Africa, knows Africa very well and witnessed personally the poor way in which we were behaving and, and the poor way in which we were coordinated. I think we'll remain committed to 0.7% of um, gross national income, uh, but the definition under ODI might change to include softer requirements in uh, stronger economies. That's, the, that's why the Prime Minister mentioned Ukraine in his speech the other day. That's a very interesting tie-in of things there. A sort of slight follow-up um, uh, here from Quezzy uh, doing Natural Sciences at Cambridge. Uh, Quezzy says, in your judgment, is Africa underappreciated as a market for Western investment? Oh, Quezzy, thank you. That is such a good question. So I've been, uh, I, I refer to myself sometimes as an African. 68,000 years ago, we were all African. And I'm a great supporter of the Paleontological Trust in South Africa, the origin of man. Um, we don't understand Africa very well. When I started Eight Miles with Bob Geldof, it was called Eight Miles, which was a private equity group, because Africa is only eight miles from Europe. And yet we sit here in Europe in a complete blank as to what Africa is. We make so many mistakes. Um, when you know government ministers arrive in different countries they, they sort of they're tempted to start a speech with something like it's lovely to be here in africa and i've tried to tell them you're not in africa you're in nigeria or south africa or kenya or wherever so there's a general lack of understanding um, and it shouldn't be that way uh, the opportunities to invest in so many countries are so exceptional uh, i in particular I'm currently supporting the, the Maasai, as I mentioned them earlier, in the development of their intellectual property. And I want to protect their, um, their rights to income from use of their brand. That's just one thing where, you know, there's so much opportunity to partner with uh, the cultures and the histories and the, and the uh, economies of Africa. Now, the, one of the reasons is that the populations are actually extremely low. So, you know, and the GDPs are very low. So the total gross domestic product of the entire continent is, is not so great. And it's dominated by Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa. Um, so, so many other countries are just, just so small uh, in terms of GDP. So it's a very difficult continent to fathom. And most people tend to work on the top 10 countries. Um, and the, uh, and the others are, uh, are left alone, which is incredibly sad. They need enormous foreign direct investment. The next few years, they're gonna need more and more capital. And over the past 12 months, 12 weeks, the amount of um, available liquidity to the African markets has gone down as international investors has, have sold out of emerging markets in their, in their panic. So we need to support um, Africa as much as possible. Brilliant. I'm going, going slightly conscious of time. You've been so generous to give so much. Do you think just a couple more questions? Oh, well, maybe? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, brilliant. Um, here's a question from 
David doing economics at Goldsmiths. Uh, David asks, what do you believe enables a graduate to succeed in being a lateral thinker that also thinks ahead of time and with consideration of how the investment world is changing? Well, well, firstly, to be a lateral thinker, I would experience more than um, the world that you're probably being taught about at the moment. So I would experience a lot of the real world uh, and that you're, you probably have already. So I don't mean to suggest anything, but travel, um, learning about, I always encourage the learning of, of charity. Um, I think I learned when we set up the Center for Social Justice, which is this think tank that focuses on the root causes of poverty. I learned more about business from that than anything. And it's got nothing to do with business, but I learned about how communities work and how people think. Um, a bit, and I once, um, when I was working in Sweden in the 1990s, I led the restructuring of the co-op. It was an enormous organization with 30 companies. And I, my presumption on the way in was that the co-op was a sort of useless group, you know, no equity, rather sort of wishy-washy principles, you know, 100 um thousand members you can't raise capital and i was in charge of the the restructuring so this is this is a nightmare uh, a, a year later i emerged thinking the cooperative model was the most incredible business um, lesson i've ever been through on how to build sustainable business practices with pure impact before the word had even been invented so, so i think it's wide experience um, looking for things that are a bit unusual I don't know where you are in your studies, but I would definitely focus on, on history um, and lessons from the past and be extremely well informed. My other advice in my company, we have a session every morning at 8.30 called The Papers, and we all read the papers together. And whatever you do, please don't read papers online, uh, buy them and look at how the arguments are constructed and how the pages are laid out. It's an extremely difficult thing to do, but anyone who can get used to reading the Financial Times, figure out how to, how to read it. It's extremely difficult and complex, but after a few months, um, in 10 minutes every morning, you learn more about everything in the world from the FT. Um, I guess we'll do second last question here, um, yeah. coming from, from Emily. Uh, doing history at Oxford. Um, Emily asks, where do you see the future of regulation developments, especially on green bonds and sustainable financial investments, and how and how should organisations prepare? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think there will be regulation, uh, more regulation, um, both financial regulation and, and market and sustainable financial investments means in a way recording and measuring um, sustainability and probably winning credit for that and uh, achieving a new a new status or a new valuation at the moment though most of this green bonds are there is a regulatory framework there but most of this type of regulation is um, market-based and not regulatory based. So for example, uh, B Corps, if you look at B Labs UK, which is the charity that allows B Corps to be, to be founded. I started B Labs UK, who was the first chairman, and we issue um, an approval rating so you can become a B Corp. So in a way you can become a sustainable uh, business and get um, a credit for it. Uh, I don't, Having started that group over here, I'm sometimes not always convinced. I think it's a little bit too in your face, a bit too draconian. And it's as though a, a charity has given you a license and therefore you're presumed to be better than others. There's something that doesn't still rest with me that's quite right about that. Uh, I, I generally believe that regulation should be um, as light touch as possible. You should allow the market to make mistakes. You should allow evolution. 
because if you over-regulate anything, you alter the course of the way an industry is evolving. It happened in venture capital. The European community through the Paris regulator ESMA created AIFMD, which is the Alternative Investment Fund Managers Directive for Private Equity and Venture Capital. It was written for hedge funds. Then they realized that private equity funds were slightly like hedge funds because somebody said to them they're both alternatives, this sort of ridiculous language. So private equity funds were put into the AIFMD regulatory framework. And we spent one and a half years unpicking that to protect how private equity would evolve and develop because the regulatory framework was too restrictive and it would have essentially collapsed part of the industry. One impact was that smaller funds would have such an expense in reporting that uh, they wouldn't be able to, to, to start in the first place. So we would kill off all the smaller funds and the startup funds, but the big funds who could afford this regulation would flourish. So I was in Paris as part of these negotiations and I pointed out this is very, very good for oligopolies. And if you want Europe and America to be dominated by the greatest and richest private equity firms, where the founders are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, that's fine. Keep regulating. But if you want an entrepreneurial society, um, allow the younger ones to flourish, and then you need light touch regulation. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting area, but I'd always encourage regulators to sort of back off and allow allow the creatives to think and then make a mistake and, and then then regulate. <laughs> you see what I mean? Great. Thanks, Mark. We thought this might be an interesting one to, to end on. Um, question from Andrew doing chemistry at UCL. Andrew says, Mark, thank you very much for the talk. Um, what are your thoughts on the potential introduction of UBI? UBI... Oh, well, that's funny. That's the last question. I don't know what UBI is. Universal basic income. Oh, um, no, no. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> so, I, I just, um, I worry that if you look at the work of the Center for Social Justice, a universal basic minimum income for everyone will, some, will take something out of society and I don't, I don't quite know how to explain it, but it's something to do with risk or courage or entrepreneurship. There are other ways of protecting the poorest. And please look at the work of the CSJ. And we believe there in that think tank, I'm no, I'm no longer um, connected to it, but I, I chaired it for many years. We believe there that the root cause of inequality and poverty is five principal drivers, including uh, a lack of education, uh, a lack of employment, and, and a number of others, I won't go through everything, but often in communities that have no way out. So you can be born into a weaker or poorer community and you cannot get out. You cannot get to Oxford or you cannot get to Cambridge. Hopefully you can. You can fight your way through the system just by give, being given a break. But I don't think a universal basic income would actually lead to the spirit. There are other things. There are other things in the quality of education, uh, much higher quality education required everywhere, introducing job schemes and startup schemes in some of the weaker economies and encouraging investment in weaker economies. So for example, in East Glasgow, unemployment is very high still. If you had purpose investing and impact reporting, impact investing, you would encourage companies to invest there, employ people, build skills, build jobs, have a tremendous impact on secondary jobs. And you would be rewarded for that if you could show that in your external rate of return, you were doing such a good thing for society. And then capital would follow you if they rewarded your societal impact. So I think there are many other ways, many more successful ways of driving um, a change in, in, in wealth and opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your time and your insights with us in what has been a truly informative and fascinating session.
Uh, thank you also to everyone watching for all your questions. We recommend that you look up the Center for Economic Re Recovery and some of uh, Mark's writing online to learn more. And we look forward to welcoming you all again soon at our up upcoming events. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Abbas. Thank you.